Good morning, everybody. That took ages to come through. Sorry, I pressed the button ages ago and was waiting for us to go live. Um, I hope everybody's well. A uh, very warm welcome to writing.ie and hopefully we are streaming to YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. Um, I'm Sam Blake, as you know, and um, I look after writing.ie and um, also write thrillers. So I am very excited to welcome today um, Maxine May Fei Chung. But I'm going to bring um, my partner in crime, Simon Truin, in to do the proper introductions. So I will be back in a second. There we go, Mr. Truin. I'm going to vanish for a second and I'll come back in the other way, the other door. Okay, you do that. It's a, it's a, it's a morning of many doors. Um, welcome. Uh, it's uh, Good Friday. We're about uh, just heading into the uh, bank holiday weekend. Um, and we're really, really glad to be back. We've, we've had a little bit of a break, but we are back with a bang with an amazing hour ahead of us with uh, two incredible women in conversation. Uh, Sam Blake, you've just seen, and you're about to meet uh, Maxine uh, Meifung Chung, whose new novel, debut novel, no doubt, uh, uh, The Eighth Girl, has blasted onto the scene, and uh, she's quite clearly going to be a big name to watch in the future. Uh, she has come to writing from uh, an interesting route. She seems to have had um, at least two really big careers. One is ongoing, and then the new one uh, as a writer. So she was a creative director for 10 years at um, the world's most stylish magazine group, Condé Nast, and then uh, also at Sunday Times and The Times. Um, and she is a psychoanalytic uh, psychotherapist and a clinical supervisor based in London. So um, there is nothing she doesn't know about uh, character. Or um, her debut novel is so multi-layered, uh, brilliant, and utter page turner. And I'm really interested to see um, what Sam Blake manages to dig up below the surface of uh, creativity. So, um, in addition to this having come out in the US and the UK, it's already been optioned uh, by uh, producer Michael Costigan and uh, actor, writer, director. Pat, uh, Jason Bateman uh, for Netflix. Uh, so there is a lot going on, and I'm sure this is not the only novel she will ever be writing. Anyway, Maxine, you are very welcome. Sam, you are very welcome. I have the pleasure now of sitting back and listening to you in conversation. Absolutely, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm gonna bring Maxine in now, so this is where the jiggling happens. Get rid of Mr. Truin goes out. There's Maxine coming in just now for a second. There we go, oh. there you are in London. Um, lovely to have you. So exciting, Mr. Yeah, Simon's down there. I'm just, I'm just going to mute you, Simon, in case you um, see what happens now. There we go. I think I've muted him now, just in case Ted decides to uh, blast up onto his uh, laptop. So, Maxine, I am so excited to talk to you today. Um, Simon's given us a great introduction there to give to give a sense of the fact that you had. A, a vast ranging, incredible professional career, still have, because obviously you're a psycho psychoanalyst now, um, but also an author. And so I want to have, I suppose I want to ask you to start with, I know you did the Faber Academy course, didn't mm -hmm. you? Um, did. yeah. Are you the type of person who feels that they need to sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why, I'll, I'll start this again. It's not, I'm, I also have to say to everybody that I'm completely um, fangirling you because I was, I said to you <laughs> earlier, I was like, Oh, I've got to talk this morning. So scary. She's so successful. Um, but anyway, that aside, um, you've done. You're you're really successful in the various areas you're in. When you sat down to write a book or came up with the idea initially, did you feel that you needed to qualify in that area in order to write the book? Is that why you did the Faber course? Yeah. Or how did that come about? It's, it's a really great question, Sam. It's so great to be here, and thank you so much to you and Simon for inviting me. It's uh, great to come here and and talk to you. So. I um I guess I wanted um to work with other writers, you know, to riff with other writers, to kind of have a sense of how we how we do this thing that is writing, you know. And I'd always kind of written secretly, I guess. And being a therapist, I write notes and and so forth. And I used to write a lot of poetry when I was younger, and I was very interested in short stories. But I just wanted maybe to kind of connect with other writers because I think writing forces us to do deeply unfashionable things, which is to kind of lock ourselves away in a room and write. And I, I guess I just wanted that connection and guidance obviously from some of the teachers as well. 
at the Faber Academy. Yeah, excellent. And did you find it helped? At what stage were you at at that point with sort of the idea and were you working yeah. on it? Um, so, where, where, where you went, went in? Yeah, I had an idea. Um, I was very clear about the idea, but I wasn't able to give myself permission to say that I was writing a novel. So that took about four years, I think, to actually give myself permission to, to say I was writing. Um, yes. And one of the pieces of advice at the Faber Academy was to give ourselves permission to say we were writing, um, yes. which was very um, helpful and quite empowering as well. Um, so yeah, it was it was really useful in terms of um, you know I met some other authors and uh, we built up subgroups as well. I'm still good friends with a couple of the people that I met there. Um, so no, it was incredibly helpful. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I think it is that networking thing because that's one of the things about being a writer is that you are very much on your own. Yeah. Um, and I'm really interested in, in what you're saying there about yeah that permission to be a writer because when I certainly when I started writing I was writing for years before I did a workshop and um, Julie Parsons who's a crime writer facilitated it and she basically one of the first things she said as we sat down was you're all writers mm. call yourself writers you know and I think there's that there is that thing that we don't you know more about this now from your in your profession to we don't give ourselves the credit that we're going That's to do right. something. Yeah. Her point was that you know painters paint they don't have to sell a painting to call themselves a painter. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to sell a book to call yourself a writer. And it's if it's sure. something you love. And I think embracing that, yes, yeah. yeah, giving yeah. yourself permission to, to sit down and write. Definitely. And I think, you know, there is something of the we can only call ourselves a writer if we're published. But in fact, mm -hmm. we are all writers. And, you know, I think to give ourselves that permission is really helpful for the process as well. Take yeah. ourselves seriously. Absolutely. I think it takes away it takes away some of the blocks, doesn't it? It just helps you yeah. flow a bit better. So tell me, when you started at that point when you were going to Favour and stuff, was The Eighth Girl in your head? Is that where you started? Was that your first book? Or? So it was my first book, but it's had many reincarnations in terms of the story plot and how it kind of turned out. It was initially called Who's That Girl? Okay. Which um, that makes I sense. Kind of, I can see that. Yeah. And it it kind of remained who's that girl until we went until we sold um to william morrow morrow in the us so i kind of had to get used to having a different name it was almost a bit like naming your child yes having it for five years and then yeah. actually they're not called that anymore you know so that took some readjusting mm -hmm. um but um i just arrived at faber with with an idea which was that um i had a protagonist who was living with did dissociative identity disorder previously known as multiple personality disorder and and crimes had been committed against her that was all i had and so the first draft was very much just trying to get to know her and character development really find a story absolutely that's really interesting but you were i was i attended your launch the other day with um will dean and harriet T trice which is fantastic and it's really mm -hmm. interesting to hear you talking about your process through that um and you were saying that you're not really a plotter so that's so <laughs> finding a way into the story talk to me a little bit yeah. about how you manage that i i'm i yeah i'm pretty terrified of plot sam <laughs> i'm very driven by character so i kind of I've spent a lot of time, you know, evolving Alexa, the protagonist of Eighth Girl, and I've allowed her to lead me the way. So I'm not somebody that can plot within an inch of, of the life, you know, of the book. And so I'm in total awe of, of authors that are able to do that because, you know, we get that kind of flabby centre, don't we, that yeah. how are we going to get through this? How do we keep the pace and the movement? And, you know, I'm not somebody that naturally writes with end of chapter hooks or end of you know chapter um short circuits of the brain so um yeah mine is very character driven and i allow the characters to show me the way um so i'm not yeah i'm not a natural thriller beat kind of girl i would like to be i'd like to learn how to do that a little more yeah yeah well we were talking earlier you were saying that you've been through multiple drafts and i think if you're not a plotter there and you're uh, you just need to I think need to be happy that that's that's going to be your process and, yeah, it's, and yeah. it's finding your way into it so how many how many drafts did you do I want to talk to you about how you found your agent mm. as well but how many drafts did you do before you even got to that point so um before publishing do you mean yeah well before you found your agent before you got oh to okay that. so I think before I found my agent there was probably five drafts mm -hmm. Um, and then um, I had a British agent at that point. Um, and then we found a US agent and it went through probably another 
seven drafts after that. So it's really a long process. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. But it, I think through every draft, the book benefits, doesn't it? And you can yeah. see the changes and see the improvements and um, it sort of moves you along. And how, so tell me, talk to me a little bit about how you found your first agent, because I know a lot of people on, on who are listening mm. to this are very interested. They're at that stage mm. you were at where they have an early draft or mm. they've got a, a book that they've worked on for ages and they've sure. got their heart and soul into it. How did, yeah. how did you find your agent? So at the Faber Academy, we have an end of year reading. Um, and I was very fortunate to be approached by a, a few agents. And um, I actually went with somebody that I knew before through a personal acquaintance. Um, but I met with all the agents. Yeah. And so I was very, very lucky um, in yeah. that way. And then, so I went with Eugenie Furness um, eventually, um, and that's been fantastic. A great experience. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. That's a brilliant. It's a brilliant opportunity for Faber. For anybody who does the Faber Academy courses, um, yeah, you have this reading in the Faber anthology, don't you? Which is sent out to loads of agents. Um, yeah. I get a copy too, and we get you can read through it and um, see, you know, what you like. And yeah. um, one of the things that's really clear that stands out, and I imagine would have stood out of that reading, um, is your voice. Um, and this is just an amazing piece of work, the Eighth Girl, for me reading it, because it's it's crime but it's it's literary as well it's beautiful um it's beautiful i'm gonna to have to read a line here this line this is one of the things that just um this is a, just a completely random line but just to show you guys i want you to make sure you'll buy this book i'm gonna ping it because i'm gonna do this now sorry there is there is coordination to the tech here here we go we'll put the cover in there we go and that's oh, sent out the buy link at the same time so everybody can see it so i just wanted to read this so this is um we are in pages page 64 so it's right at the start um, but just to give you an idea of the type of writing, um, two girls pull their boyfriends in close when they catch sight of Ella, her shoulders pulled back for extra zeal, her swaying silhouette like the night glide of a lynx. Now, I've put a, li a line under that. I wouldn't have even got swaying silhou silhouette, never mind the night glide of a lynx. I just think that's just amazing. Um, did you work on... Did the words just come, or did you work um, on them? Or what, like, where does this come from? I <laughs> Are you to know? Oh, thank you so much, Sam. That that means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, I think that people have asked me about the the lyrical nature of the writing. So I think at heart, I'm a poet. I'm an author that, you that has yeah. a poet's heart. Yeah. Um, I've always read a lot of poetry. You know, when I was a little girl, I was writing poems at you know teenage years and. Um, I was very much influenced by um, a librarian um, called Mrs. Veal, who introduced me to poetry from a very young age as well. So I like to combine hard edge crime with um, lyricism in a way and to try and find ways to do that. So it alleviates us from the crime and gives us a breather. So um, we can kind of dip into description, but then go into a hard line where it's hard boiled crime or thriller beat. So, um, yeah, I, I try quite, I, I wouldn't say I try hard, it, it's how I write, but I'm yeah. conscious of having my feelings very much at the surface when I'm writing. It's fantastic. The descriptions are beautiful. The descriptions are, you are actually living in the moment with her all the way through the book. Um, and so that's, and I think there's that blend of, um, I think to me that's really important in crime is that you get that sense of place and location. Yeah. Um, and um, you are absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely there. The descriptions are fantastic. So for anybody who is struggling with description, this is a really, really good book to read. Um, but the core of this story is character, multiple characters. <laughs> so uh, many characters. Mm -hmm. And you, I'm not, we have to be very careful with spoilers here. I'm, I urge you to, to pick up that link that I've flicked into there and order your copy. It comes in a beautiful hardback. Look at that. So make mm -hmm. sure you do. Um, and there's nothing nicer than the hardback book. Um, Talk to me about Alexa and where she came from and how you made the decisions about, because obviously you said she, she has multiple, multiple personalities, who those personalities were going to be and how you managed to craft them um, to be so different. Mm. Talk to mm. me about that. Great question, Sam. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a large part of my practice um, some years ago was working with women and girls that were exiting the sex industry. And... Um, some of these women had experienced horrific crimes. And, and what I was hearing was that the way that people that were living with multiple personalities was not true. And it certainly wasn't how I was experiencing these women and girls. So there was something of a desire to truly represent. 
Um, so um, people that have been kind of shoehorned into these kind of lunatic tropes, serial killers. Yes. It felt very um, offbeat. It felt very um, lacking in compassion and empathy and, yeah. and sometimes misunderstanding of them because people that are living with DID are often the people that are the victims to crimes, not the ones who commit them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that felt really, really important for me. Um, and the other thing was that um, I felt that there was not very much representation in terms of Asian protagonists in the crime genre, thriller genre too. So that, and you know, in terms of writing about what you know, I know a little bit about that being half Chinese. So that felt important for me as well. Um, so this was kind of the beginnings of Alexa. Yeah, yeah as, as the whole self. And, and then um, I started to introduce characters and, and I very much thought about them as, you know, separate people to Alexa. You know, they were very much living and eating and breathing as we do. They were not just voices in her head. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I built characters as, as, as we would in any novel, really, that, that were alive and well. So um, there were a lot more personalities than what is actually in Eighth Girl at the moment. It was getting a little bit complicated. <laughs> so, um, and so we've got characters that are pretty fierce. We've got a younger character who, um, her Daisy. name is Dolly, yeah. yeah Dolly, sorry. sorry. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a case of really, uh, without being too caricature about it, it was, it was just about giving her a fully rounded self with all these different parts, really. And they're really strong, these characters. I mean, they're literally characters in themselves. Um, I love I love their names as well. Did you spend a long time? You've got yeah. Cows and you've got Runner and, um, yeah, um, Dolly. You had, did yeah. you spend a lot of time working on, on that element? Yeah, so Runner, Runner, who's probably... Runner and Dolly are my favourite characters. Um, Runner, we gave her the name because she's fierce and she runs rings around people. You know, we can imagine her feet are on fire. Yeah. Um, and then we've got Honorio, which is the Greek um, term for the dreamer. So, and and she is very ethereal and thoughtful and daydreamy. So, yeah, there was again not to try and um, characterize too much, but to kind of have names that were suitable for the for the character development in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's fascinating, and the, and you. It, it is complicated because obviously these characters are coming and going, but the way you've managed to, um, Alexa has conversations as she's going through her day. She, these various mm. characters are talking to her and they're coming through and she's having conversations and sometimes she is them. And um, I found at the start of the book, it was really interesting that um, Ella could recognize the different characters yeah. see when I got to the end, um, but um, that she could see her changing. And so she, and at one point she goes, there's a, so there's a dual narrative in this book, isn't there? We've got Alexa Wu and then we've got Daniel Rosenstein, who yes. is her, who's her psychoanalyst. Yeah. Um, and so we've got his story running through too. And there is a point where he sees her change personality too. And sure. when, when she goes in to talk to him and she's actually um, Dolly rather than herself. Yeah. Um, and I just found that it was mesmerizing, actually, managing to keep all the balls in the air mm. and not to lose her to any particular voice. Yeah. And more to be there. I just think that that felt to me like a mastery. Did it take a was that part of the redrafting? process? Yes, it was exactly right, Sam. That's yeah, yeah. that's exactly why, because we had to make sure that we didn't miss a beat in terms of well, that wouldn't happen if if that was another personality, they had to exist, you know, as yeah. if they were. And sometimes it could become quite confusing. So the redrafting was about trying to have it as simple as possible, but whilst getting the character across. Um, so certainly that's where the redrafting was. And there was many ways of how we were going to show that, you know, in the writing method, whether it was inverted commas or italics. And we had to try lots of different ways so the reader didn't have to work too hard. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's, it's really interesting. It's, it's interesting you say that that the reader didn't have to work too hard because that it does flow beautifully. Mm. And then one of the because one of the problems you can have with a book is that you the reader gets snagged if they have to work hard. Yeah. So yeah. it's that it's keeping literally keeping all the balls in there, keeping it all smooth, mm. um, but keeping it interesting and kicking on. Because as you said right at the start, 
um, Alexa is in a situation where she's struggling with all these various voices and people who are dominating her life. And um, but yet crime happens to her. So yeah. it's a really, in many ways, it's a revenge book, isn't it? That she's yeah. there to, yeah. to try and um, get right. back to people who hurt her. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. So did you, sorry, did you start off with the sex industry as a background because of your experience or was mm. that something that came later? Yeah, yeah, that was very much, when I started out as a shrink, I was very much involved with activism around women mm. who were exiting the sex industry. So it's been something that I've advocated for for many years and, and what I still continue to advocate for. So it certainly informed some of the work and so, some of the writing um, yeah. and you know, also with our first drafts, I know we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, Sam, that we have the luxury of time as well for the first novel, whereas I imagine, you know, you're five books in now, aren't you, Sam? Yeah, yeah indeed, but, yeah. You know, you I imagine you're on a kind of roller coaster now of getting the books out, and with the first one, you can take a lot longer, and yeah, kind of gives me the fear slightly, I have to say. <laughs> it's not too bad, I'd say it's not too bad with... Um, now I'm writing, this is for everybody out there, now I'm writing standalones, I yes. think, each book. And so it's definitely easier that I feel like I've got a lot more time. Whereas when I was writing the series, they were coming, they were coming on to Every year. Every year, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so I think I'm probably, I don't know if I have the same amount of time, but I think you have, you do find that you can get into this, this mm. roller coaster situation. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that is the joy. And I think the, the that luxury of time, but also mm. you're learning at the same time, mm. aren't you, with the first book. So, mm. Through the drafting process through the character development finding the way finding the story there's a lot going into that sure. um that yeah. needs to be sort of found i suppose for you for a first-time novelist um so did you are you pleased the way it's turned out is it what you had in mind when you started it's just so much more than i ever imagined i just i really just did write it with no expectations and i just thoroughly enjoyed it because i learned a lot about myself one of the things I really learned was how to be kind to myself in this process. And just meeting other authors, you know, Will and Harriet have been incredibly supportive and yourself. And it's it's been absolutely amazing. And, you know, I, I never imagined that it would be picked up for Netflix or that, you know, it would, yeah, be received so well in the UK, especially my home country, because we came out in the US first of all. Yeah. Yeah. And that felt a little bit distancing. So it was really nice for it to come out here. I'm hoping to be able to go to Waterstones or other bookshops, you know. More exactly. Bookshops. See it on the, the shelf. One. Yeah. yeah, won't be long. Won't be long now. And then you can have a so. big, big belated book party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, it is It is really interesting. It's, um, I think, yeah, the experience, it's, it's very strange launching in lockdown. But then I suppose as a debut also, because you haven't launched in any You don't know any then, different. Any different. different. <laughs> so it's like, it's all fine. It's yeah, all great. Just very grateful to be published, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all feel like that. I <laughs> love <laughs> oh, to get the reviews and things coming in and people liking uh -huh. it. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's. I just I just feel like it's it's an absolute work of art, this book, um, and particularly from the character point of view, from the, the from using the beautiful language. You have a bird theme. This is very interesting with something mm. I just saw when we were chatting before. You have a bird theme running through it. Um, Alexa refers to her personalities as the flock, um, and the bird thing comes pops up in lots of different places mm. all the way through. Was that something that you consciously did, or was it? Did that just come out of the writing? That just kind of evolved as the writing went along. There's a Chinese poem that um, I was very keen and kind of insisted that at I wanted to yeah. keep at the yeah. end. And um, it's a poem that I kind of grew up with as a little girl as well. So that felt quite important because, again, my love of poetry. Um, yeah. But it wasn't conscious and the flock evolved. And, and in a way, I think as a writer, I was trying to kind of contain them because they were feeling unruly, you know, and I thought, right, if I create a nest, I can have them go there and it can give me a breather as the writer as well yeah. and obviously give Alexa a breather. So it was something that very much evolved um, and she's also a photographer, so she uses that lens um, to kind of take photographs of birds. And so again, it was just introducing a soft edge to the crimes that were being committed again. And, and in terms of, um, you know survival really you know she turns to nature for survival and um it was a really nice anchor for the book actually the bird theme so yeah it gives it a lovely it gives it a, a lovely third dimension because crime 
like especially far, you know crime that's gritty and can be can be not one dimensional is the wrong word but it can be quite um it can be quite because I suppose you're focusing on plot and it can be quite fast yeah um having those metaphors in there and that depth behind mm. it um, was wonderful and you were saying that your Chinese name translates tell us what that translates as well, yeah as Mei Fung is, is actually um, beautiful phoenix so it's the phoenix rising which is a name given to me by my Chinese grandmother so that's wonderful yeah without even realizing I guess this has come full thing. and right at the end we won't tell what happens at the end but there's a phoenix image and yeah. she's there and she sees the phoenix and that's what, right. what she wants to be. And that, that to me, when you said it this morning, I was like, wow. <laughs> that's yeah. right. I don't yeah. know if that was conscious or subconscious, but it just, um, it all feeds in just beautifully. It just, it all, yeah, literally it just all meshes. Um, and in terms of your writing, when you were writing it, um, sort of your how you write your day-to-day -day thing, mm. do you, you're really busy because obviously, I mean, we were talking earlier and Maxine's already seen three people already this morning, um, haven't you? And you're in your professional world. So, and it's Good Friday and it was only 11 o'clock yeah. when we had that. So you are obviously very busy. It's very, that's a very intense job that you have yeah. as a writing analyst. How do you fit in writing around the edges? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was really hard because I think that, you know, I often want to say I've, my son who was, you know, very young when I started writing this book and he definitely earns the accolade of, you know, patience of a teenager because um I was getting up at five or six in the morning writing for a couple of hours um doing the school run coming back doing clinical work picking my son up then working in the evenings and the weekends um and so I wanted to be really present as a you know I was raising my son alone so I wanted to be present for that process I wanted to be present for my patients and I wanted to be present for the writing process. So I just gave myself permission to say that it was going to take some time. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, my son's a teenager and, and, you know, I don't have to pick him up from school anymore. So <laughs> I've got a lot more time, which is great. But there were moments, himself. Yeah. <laughs> but there were real moments of frustration and, um, you know, wishing there were more hours in the day. Um, but what I tried my best to do was to turn that frustration into fuel and to really kind of, um, you know, give myself a routine. I didn't have the luxury of waiting for a muse to arrive or anything, you know, it was literally get your ass on the seat and start writing. And, and that's, that's what I tried my best to do. So we'll see what happens now. I've got more time on my hands, you know. <laughs> the second book, absolutely. I think, I think it's really important though um, that, you've got that dedication and that drive and for people who want to um mm -hmm. to succeed in this industry yeah. that is vital i mean you've got yeah, to have that is. you've got to have it in there and not yeah they're not messing about but i think when you've got limited time it's actually a better thing because you get yeah. more done i agree like, you know, they always talk about say give a busy person a job um exactly. yeah yeah because you do you when you sit when you've only got 20 minutes or you've only got and you're going to sit down you're going to write yeah you've got to make those words count haven't you sam yes. uh, yeah. you know if we've got only you know two hours in the morning or, or whatever or wherever we're all working you know the weekends we've got to make those words count it doesn't matter about them being perfect words or just have the words and yeah. um, you know just get them down you can always go back and re-edit and redraft yeah. Yeah, and that's I think and that's the beauty of writing. Um, somebody was saying, I saw somebody, I think somebody on Twitter the other day was saying that they were worried about um, submitting and getting stuff out there, and they were worried that they were good, they'd sort of ground to a paralyzing halt with this draft. And my point was that this is not the draft that anybody's going to see. Yeah. We, it's not like X Factor. It's yeah. not like you go out there <laughs> oh, and you can do thing and you can watch up. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh my God. Whereas this, we get we get chance to, like you said, read the twelve drafts that exactly. ended up like this we're seeing it so yeah. from what you started with to what you ended up with yeah is yeah. that process is that time that's yeah. going into it um no I love that and I love the giving I love that advice. first draft Sam I'm I'm that you know, your favorite I've, bit? I've likened it to a love affair you know mm -hmm. that first draft it's wild and you know it's full of passion and you fall in love with the with the storytelling and it's you know you can't eat or think clearly and you can only do it for so long you can you know and and then you settle into it and you you know start to know the characters a bit like a love affair then you 
you know, start to do the washing and you kind of start eating and shopping together, it normalizes. Yeah. But it's, I love the unruliness of that first draft. It feels very wild and... Um, that's, brilliant. Yeah. that's a brilliant analogy. I think that's just fantastic because that's that is what it's like, isn't it? It's like, yeah, that the, the, yeah. the first session when you meet somebody and then and yeah. then you set yeah, settle into the washing. Yeah, yeah. You're sorting laundry before you know it, aren't you? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you get to the third draft, it's like, yeah, who right. Page yeah. Here? Let's get it all sorted out. Um that's that's a really, really clever analogy. <laughs> um yeah. And it's really interesting to talk to writers to find out which part of the process they like. I really love a first draft because I I am finding the story, but I also find it a bit like an uphill sprint. Like mm -hmm. while I enjoy an uphill sprint, I find it quite, it can be quite hard. Um, whereas like, when I get to a second draft of the editing, that's what I really love because then I've got the thing yeah. and I'm starting yeah. to shape and move things around and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's actually something that was interesting when you were talking to Will and Harriet the other day because um, you were talking about the whole plot, the fact that you don't plot, yeah. and they were talking about which bits they liked. And it was really interesting that we all end up the same thing, but we all have these yeah. different approaches. We discovered we're all very emotional with the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all listens to slow, sad songs. Harriet, you know, walks, walks and walks it out. I go to my garden, you know, so we all, we're all quite emotional, actually, when we write, yeah, first draft. Yeah, it's that. I think it's, but it's connecting with that inner voice, isn't it? Mm. It's connecting with your subconscious that's so important in that first draft and yeah. listening to it. And and there has to be an emotional um, sort yeah. of connectivity and emotional exchange in order for that to happen, yeah. for it to get onto the page. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear you talk about it. And I can, you can feel when you now having read it, you can, I can feel Alexa growing and. Mm. You know how she developed and mm. and how you found your way through um as you know because i'm a huge fan of cat cat Connolly. <laughs> just that blew me away um, this morning when you yeah, and, and i was really interested because you you know the, the trilogy mm. of the cat Connolly series which i absolutely love and i was always really interested about you know when you take one book and you make it into two and three and you have that continued relationship and as an attachment-based therapist i love that energy you know i love the thought of actually you're not done with with cat yet she's coming into your second book now and she's then going into your third so i love that kind of stream of consciousness between the three books yeah i, I think it's lovely to write one of the things about writing series that's great is that once you've done all the work on the characters and you know them and yeah. literally it's like walking back into a pub so you've got, you know, and they're all standing there waiting for you. And all you've got, yeah, all you've got, what yeah. you're doing is you're bringing the plot. Yeah. Um, and then, so then the hard bit is trying to come up with a really good plot. But, sure. um, but the characters, yeah, you know them. And, you know, I mean, Kat, I, mean, I think it should be like Alexa with you. I feel like Alexa jumps off the page when you read her because there's a lot going on, but she's so true to her voice all the way mm. through the book. And mm. I can I imagine that she is completely in your head and she's she's somebody you know intimately. Um, and I'm a bit like that with Kat. Kat says things that I would never say. She's quite funny and she's yeah. not at all. Um, but uh, did you find that with Alexa that you that you uh, you must have had between all the various drafts? Actually, you probably got quite a bit that didn't go into the book. So yeah, I mean, I, I was saying earlier. You know, on the one hand, I'm incredibly sad now that my relationship with her, you know, is finished in terms of the writing sense. It's it is a bit like sending your kid off to uni yeah. and just hoping you've given them enough tools to be able to take good care of themselves and it's a kind of bittersweet feeling because you know I miss writing her I miss yeah. um you know thinking about the shenanigans that she might get up to or or you know the vulnerabilities and um but in a way I'm also relieved because it was very grueling you know that, yeah. that first novel so there's that kind of complex uh place where yeah, I'm pleased to see her go, but I'm I miss yeah, her too. Yeah. yeah, you still feel that bereavement. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. But you because you've lived with her so long, and you've lived in, yeah. and like you say, it's that thing where you in the first draft, it's in your head the whole time, Absolutely. and it doesn't matter what else you're doing, it's just there. And yeah, the stories yeah. are developing, and you're seeing things, and you're feeding them in, and mm. it's weaving it all together. Um, yeah, and especially a book that that's this intense because there's a lot yeah. you can feel it in her. Yeah um that i yeah i can really see that yeah there was um there was a moment in the final edit and you kind of see the contagion when you start to work with your editors around this because i would got a line um where alexa's having a drink or coffee and, and my editor said to me but she wouldn't have three sugars <laughs> you know we were talking <laughs> as if you know she was alive and, oh, no, she, wouldn't, no, she wouldn't have three sugars she you know 
and she wouldn't, yeah so we were talking as if she was really real yeah yeah that's fantastic that you were working with somebody who knew the character so well too that, yes. they, that really is there and yeah. is living them in the same way that you are that's right um, just, I mean that's what makes a leap off the page is that life that you bring to her um, and I'm all about character, and I think mm. character is vitally important. Although there's always this debate with in crime about whether how important plot is, and, yeah. um, and to me, it's the character that le you're left with when you finish a book, yeah. um, and it's the character that resonates with you afterwards. And so for me, the characters have to be three dimensional, and all the rest of it. I agree. Um, I agree. And she, yeah, and she absolutely. Well, all her characters actually are. I mean, Ella, all of the different characters in the book, mm. Anna, they all are very, very strong um, and developed. Um, although we only ever see it's like it's Hemingway's iceberg, isn't it? I'd imagine that you that you, there's so much more even that you have, and we're yeah. only seeing a little bit at the top. Yeah. Um, but they're but they really are um, true within their yeah reason. yeah yeah they're um, um, yeah they um, runner for example who who is the kind of fierce um, part she she had to kind of, we blended her basically there were two characters and. They were quite similar as we were reading it, so we thought we'll just make her one one person. So um, that was quite nice, just simplifying it all down and um, making it a little leaner in terms of the characters. I think that's really, really interesting, um, particularly for people listening, because one of the things you can start off with when you write a first draft is a is a cast of thousands and extra mm. people who actually, although they you feel like they're very important to the story, perhaps only have one thing that they're doing that's or you know yeah. they're, they're not you know I think the test is that if you can take the character out and the plot doesn't collapse yeah then they there's no part being there right. really um, but at the same time you feel bonded to them and they maybe do one or two things that yeah, yeah you yeah. need um, so that melding of characters is yeah. Yeah, I think is genius because it means then that you keep you're retaining the characteristics of the person you love but we're not cluttering the place up with yeah, people exactly. from, a, it's from a reader's perspective it's hard to keep track of everybody yeah right? yeah 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 did you have many like that that you had to do that too yeah though i mean there was a real codependency that i was experiencing you know and i had to really grapple with um my agent because they were saying but this is repeating i was like no i need to keep her and it was <laughs> and they were saying but why and, and i had to think about my own attachment styles you know and i wanted to keep them because they you know, resonated for me in some way or meant something. But of course, when I could step back from it as a writer, I could I could see very clearly that they were right and that they needed to be blended. But it, it kind of highlighted how attached I was becoming to the characters and 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 you know all their foibles and all their struggles. Yeah. I was just becoming um, more and more attached to them. So I think it's a really interesting point because that's that's the sort of the wood for the trees thing, isn't it? That yeah. they meant something serious to you. And you yeah. could see absolutely why they were intrinsic to the plot. Yeah. But from a reader's perspective, who didn't have your emotion, hadn't have all your exactly. everything that, that makes you you. Yeah. It didn't mean, yeah, uh, yeah, that's and that's really interesting. Yeah. That's and the that's the bit, isn't it? Taking a step back is the hard bit. Absolutely, you know, and one of the things that I I'm very keen on is thinking about being an expert and knowing nothing, you know, and as a therapist, that's how I arrive at work every day. And it's how I really approach writing as well, to really listen to people and to be guided, you know, not to lose your voice and to roll over, but to really harness and discuss and talk about why that's not working and learn from that. I love the learning process, yeah. you know, that I was on with this book. So I think yeah. it's fascinating. And I think, I think that's something, and again, we're back to luxury of time, that it's important to do to yeah. not race that first book because yeah, it is enjoy a it. And you, <laughs> yeah and you enjoy it and love me i know when i wrote little bones um i had some mad stuff in little bones in one of the early drafts i've got this thing about color there's an artist in little bones and originally when i think i started writing i thought it was going to be, it was going to be quite literary and i had this thing about color um and each chapter had, was themed around a color it's a bit like mm -hmm. your birds in some ways yeah. And then I realised at one point about, I don't know, five drafts in, that actually nobody would have a single clue what these, co yeah. these colours didn't bear any, like they didn't relate, they didn't relate to anything. Like yeah. as a reader, they'd be like, they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't mean anything. So, yeah. you know, and yeah, I just took them out. But um, it's it, interesting yeah, you, what we get attached to, isn't it? <laughs> it's really interesting. interesting. So long researching yeah. colours and, you know, yeah. getting them right and, and putting them in really subtly so that you, you wouldn't even <laughs> see them. But then I was like, maybe people got all these Try to sneak them in thinking they won't see it. That was another thing that I was doing. You know, well, I'll just try and get them in another way. No. <laughs> got very strict editors. And yeah. that, I think that's the joy of editing is that you, it's wonderful if you have the confidence that your editor is there to make your book better. Yeah. 
and I suppose that's trust too, isn't it? In the yeah. same way, trusting yourself to be a writer and trusting yourself to do sure. the finish. Yeah, and that, humility, you know, we have to take a level, I think, anyway, I can only speak on behalf of myself, but to really take a humility into the writing and show up. But, yeah. but, you know, do believe that, um, you know, it's important to stay true to your truth, but at the same time, you know, do listen to um, focus groups, readers groups, you know, that's why I love kind of having a few friends, not many of us, to get together to read each other's work, people I trust. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to really hear them when they say, this is not working, Max, you know, this is, let that go. And and kill those darlings and and move on and and, and see if we yeah. can keep the pace moving. I need a lot yeah. of help around the moving, as you, <laughs> with not being a natural plotter. So <laughs> keeping the pace up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting what you're saying though about the um, about the listening and the somebody can say something to you and you about something that's perhaps not working for them and you don't necessarily agree with it. Mm. But the point is the fact that it's not working for them should be throwing up absolutely a, a red flag, yeah. yeah 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 were your were your writers groups and things helpful in the in terms of pace in terms yeah of they were the story and, long? you know they were pretty brutal at times as well and um i think it, it's finding a group of people that you really trust and can mm. not just connect through in writing but connect you know as friends as well and um Again, you know, I think being an attachment-based therapist, that's very important for me. And it's not that I necessarily need a lot of people to read my work, but it's important that the people that are reading it, I, I connect with and trust. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but they, yeah, they were very helpful. And, um, you know, and Harriet was, you know, alongside me for, yeah, for the last six years, which is how long it took me to write it, so. Yeah. She's amazing. She's an amazing person to have by your side. Yeah, she, Harriet she, Trice we're talking about here. No small chicken. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> but blood orange is amazing. Um, so yeah, no, it's and I think that understanding the fact that we are writers and we work a lot. It's all internal. It's all listening mm. to subconscious. You have to do the work, but having that network around you, I think, gives you comfort because yeah. there really isn't anybody else. Except there's only really another writer who's going to understand what you're going through. Yeah, because yeah. it's just such a bizarre process. It really and it's is different for everybody isn't it yeah. um I think understanding that is and that gives you a lot of support I think support's very sure. important yeah what um, do you do with blocks Sam when you get you know we we talk about you know whether writer's block does actually exist or you know what do you do if you ever get stuck or or well, I believe absolutely 100% that block, writer's block is due to your subconscious mind to putting the brakes on so yeah. it means you've gone wrong somewhere. So mm. it might be a character, so something out of character. It could be your three sugars. You know, if you're <laughs> going with the three sugars, that's exactly yeah. the type of thing that can cause a block. Yeah. Because you put the three sugars in, it was all fine, and you never even noticed. And then you'll get on a bit further, and something that relates to the sugar will come up. Mm. And, you won't, and you'll get stuck, and you won't know why. So go. I always think if you go back to where it was working, then you'll mm. find it's great. Yeah. And then you'll spot the three sugars or you'll spot what it was. I remember in In Deep Water, which is the second Cat Connolly book, I got stuck. And um, I realised why I'd got stuck. But I'd actually got stuck because of something that happened previously. Okay. So I'd made two mistakes. The first mistake occurred like five, six, seven, maybe ten chapters later, of course, the second one, which is mm -hmm. really cool. Um, and so I think it's, I think I'm a, I just think it all happens in your subconscious and understanding how your subconscious mind works and yeah. just releasing that um, and allowing and getting access to it is is what this process is yeah. about. And the more you can understand that, the more you can listen to that, the less likely you are to be blocked. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I also think I also believe very firmly that you can you need to trust the process. So sometimes if you it's difficult, it's very difficult when you're in your situation where you are cramming, you've only got so much time. If yeah. you're stuck. Yeah. Then it's like then you get the, the the absolute panic because you feel like you're wasting yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Panic. When can I get back to it? And yeah. yeah, it turns into this big nightmare. But in fact, if you can trust the process, and that's something I think you, I certainly learned through through writing because Little Bones was my first book, but it's actually about the fifth that I'd written. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like ten books down the line at this stage. Um, if you can learn to trust the process, it'll come. And it might might take a week, might take a few days, might take you just reading other things or watching news or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, and then it'll all it should all fall into place. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So just tell us a little bit about the whole Netflix experience because yeah, that's very so interesting, nice. and then we'll bring Simon in with the question. Sure, sure. Right. So um, now I was very fortunate. Um, so I think I shared that 
Eighth Girl was released in the US with William Morrow, Harper Collins, first of all, and um, was very fortunate to get approached by um, Gotham Productions with Ellen Goldsmith Fane, who um, really took a shine to the Eighth Girl, um, who then placed it with Aggregate, which is Jason Bateman and Michael Costigan. So we're currently in conversations about that. Um, and they've, um, yeah, they've, they've optioned it for Netflix as a series. Um, so we're in conversations about that, which is thrilling. Um, Very exciting. Kind of um, still can't really take it all in. Um, but we're talking about um, doing things differently in terms of the way that people living with DID are portrayed. So, you know, she, Alexa won't kill anybody. She won't be climbing walls and sprouting fangs and she will just yeah. be somebody that is has been greatly affected by the crimes committed against her yeah. so uh i'd like a sensitive portrayal um of the protagonist um so we'll see yeah but uh, it's very exciting very goodness and do you have how much involvement can you have in say the screenwriting and the casting and is there much yeah. again the casting was quite important that that I felt that she would need to be Asian, so it's true to the writing. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, Michael and I are discussing um, very much around who we would imagine playing her for fun, yeah. just for fun. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, they've they've asked me to be involved because of my psychological background and yeah. being a psychoanalyst, so they think that that might be quite helpful. It's fairly useful, I would imagine so. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, it's, it's really very, very, very exciting. Um, uh, I, I am going to really love seeing how it hits the screen because it's, I would imagine from a screenwriting perspective, it would be um, a a challenge, challenge is the wrong word, but it is a challenge. But yeah, yeah how is this going to work? Yeah. Um, it's going to be fantastic. I see Simon has rejoined us here, so I'm going to pop him in and then get him to have a to take us through some of the questions. I need to put the book oh, on the screen ahead. first. So I'm just going to give that to everybody again. Look at that fantastic cover. Um, and that's the buy link's gone out there into the um, into the comments too. So you know what to do, guys. This is click on it, please. Um, and Mr. Trim will join us now. It's on the screen. There we go. It goes all beautifully in quarters. Very smart. Oh, yeah. Wasn't that good? That's fascinating, isn't it? The whole yeah. No, I've been I've been following it on my phone on Facebook and watching it on here. So I kind of feel like you know. 360 degrees it's amazing how um how much of this has resonated with people particularly the uh the notion of a first draft being like the early days of a love affair before you start saying did you get those bin bags and you know did you put the washing yeah, out exactly. or... <laughs> and also i think your your dedication the, the, the fact that you were getting up at 5 a.m writing for two hours taking your son to school and all of that do you um i'm guessing now that your life as a as a writer is going to be coming more to the forefront mm -hmm. are, are you gonna are you gonna have a kind of conflict between being a writer and what we might i don't know which one is going to become yeah, the day job I suppose. It's a really great is that a good thing? yeah it's um something that's been on my mind I've, I've been practicing for 17 years now um so i do a little more supervision of other therapists and so i yeah. probably be tipping towards that slightly more so I get more time to write because I've, I've absolutely loved the journey of it so my idea would be to probably work in clinical practice three days a week and then to have the rest of the time writing um, so that's what I'm kind of aiming for and it's probably going to be likely after August that's so, great wow yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a dream isn't it that's the idea yeah. you know wonderful um, and also, uh, I mean, I think it sounds like you had the most incredible, rigorous process working on countless drafts with your agent and then with your publisher. Do you think we talked to a lot of debut writers and I work with a lot of debut writers mm. that so the experience of writing once you've been published is very different. You're kind of second guessing what your editor might ask you to do and that's informing how you work so tell us about what yeah. not what you're writing now but how the process has yeah. changed definitely you know the first drafts are completely rocky when you're just putting stuff out there and not knowing what it's going to be like and even when you get the publishing deal and it goes out you know i still yeah. couldn't quite take it in that i was going to be a published author but um it's a bit of a cliche but i guess that the the kind of um rule i give myself is to 
to write like no one's reading. You know that phrase like dance like no one's watching? Yeah. I thought of write yeah. like no one's reading. And I think yeah. that's the that. only way I can reach my truth. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's that's about like, writing that's for yourself. All those nuggets of gold, isn't it, that you feel like you, we should be, I, we need that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would get myself in a bit of a pickle if I was starting to write for an audience. And, you know, sometimes there's a pros and cons with that because with Eighth Girl, a lot of feedback was it, it straddled genre. You know, it was kind of literary, but it was thriller. And initially people didn't really know where to place it, but it was the only way that I knew how to write. I couldn't really write for an audience. I just had to write what felt comfortable for me. Um, do you, um, about part of being a writer is also being a reader. And, mm. you know, I read a long list of books that you, you'd been influenced by, but do you, um, do you stop reading while you're writing or are you kind of writing in the morning, reading in no, bed I'm at reading night? all the time. I've always, I've always got at least two books on the go. Um, and I read a lot of poetry as well. That's always a staple for me that um, um, I like the rhythmic balm of poems. So mm. um, I'm reading poetry all the time, but no, I, I tend to keep reading and I read widely, you know, I read um, anything from, you know, romance novels to kind of hard boiled crime. And I love the kind of vast landscape. I always feel a little bit cheated when I go into a bookstore and you have to go to certain sections. I would much prefer yeah. it. <laughs> I know it's not ideal for sales, but I just love the idea of going in somewhere and you, you're just plowing through and finding, you know, every kind of book. I know that that would be terrible sales. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it works for you. That's why readers, that's why book clubs would be great. You can't yeah. Because you can get something that you really didn't expect to read. Yeah. Um, can pop yeah. up. So, um, and one of the um, questions actually is, is whether you want. We think so. I'm going to interrupt you, Simon. Is um, whether you were thinking? Have you ever thought about getting your poetry published? Um, I haven't actually, but never say never. I'd love to. Maybe think about that. I'm a big yeah. fan of Ocean Vong at the moment. I'm reading a lot of um, Asian uh, poetry, um, and yeah, I. I'd love that opportunity. Maybe I should think about that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now's the moment. I think you'll find all doors are open to you. You know, <laughs> you should keep knocking on them. Um, you, you've talked a lot about uh, well, you talked about uh, you talked about your kind of ethnicity and your background and whether and do you you know? There's obviously a lot of talk about uh, diversity in publishing, and I mm. and I kind of feel this should be more about inclusivity rather than diversity because that, that seems yeah. to be important um have you found in america there's been more focus on your ethnic background than say in the uk when it's come mm -hmm. to reviewing the um i think there's been more opportunity to discuss it in the uk because it's just a given in the us yeah. a lot more yeah, it doesn't need right. to be discussed you know so i was very fortunate being published first of all in the States and um, yeah. prime writers of color took me under their wing uh, with Walter okay. Mosley and Kelly Garrett. And they really, really kind of helped me a lot um, to find a home because it was pretty intimidating, you know, not knowing anyone over there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's been more opportunities. You know, I wrote a piece for um, Sunday Times, um, which was about really seeing the person rather than the skin and kind of taking the human approach and it is great to see that there are more inclusive um books being published with by diverse writers as well so it, it has felt very important for me yeah as it is for me as a therapist as well um you know one I, of the I... in being a therapist is that you know people of color don't always find the therapy room as well you know so uh, I hope that my work's sort of spreading out to the therapy room and the couch and and into writing so we can have it be all be more inclusive in a way. Um, therapists, I mean, I have friends who are therapists and, and I know I know people in that profession and privacy is very important if you're a therapist, isn't it? Well, um, and I just... yeah. Uh, do you mean for the therapist themselves, or do you mean for the work, Simon? Uh, well, both actually. But I mean, I've I found some some therapists I talk to. They're they're not 
they, they don't seem very open to talk about themselves sometimes and mm -hmm. I, and in a public forum because right. privacy is very important and i just wondered whether there's been a mm -hmm. has there been a tension between your need to promote yourself as an author mm -hmm. and your wish to retain privacy as a therapist thank you for asking that that's a really fantastic question and I'm grateful for that opportunity to answer that because um, I work as a relational psychotherapist, which is um, very much about the leveling of power in the consulting room. So, um, you know, my, my patients do know that I exist outside of the four walls, you know, that I'm not just pulling a sofa bed out from the couch that's in there and living in those four walls. I do have a life outside. Um, and I found that that is the method um, that really works for me. I, I had done a, a Freudian training before I became a relational psychoanalyst. And I found that this has been the most effective way to work, particularly for people that have survived trauma and for people to see their therapist living and existing in a world and having a life is actually been very helpful for them. It can be terribly tantalizing, you know, the Freudian approach in terms of not, I mean, obviously we have to be discreet in what we're sharing. You know, most of my patients know that I'm a mother, for example, um, and, and we can work with that. And obviously I would protect boundaries, but um, yeah. I think the reason why I chose to be a relationist was because I did want to exist outside the four walls. Yeah, it's an interesting debate though, really one that I'd love to be engaged in. Right, and... Um... God, we're running out of time. That's that's always a good sign when you look at the clock and you think, <laughs> really? Um, so I, I was very I was very interested by the fact you you said earlier on about you looked at two characters and you thought they had the same kind of function in the book. Let's combine them into one. Mm. Was there any sense of loss when you did that? Yeah, you know, there of... was, and I sort of slugged it out with my agent, you know, for a while, and. Um, and stepped back a little bit. I was attached probably to the character because I maybe saw, you know, I'd experienced something, it resonated with me in some way or was attached to them in some way, but I could see how much leaner it was for the story, for the narrative um, once I got there. Um, and I was glad that I did, but yeah, it took a little bit of persuading. There's a, there was a loss to be felt for sure, yeah. Um, will you be will you be returning to any of these characters in in future forms? Do you think? I'm not sure. I mean, if, if we're fortunate enough for it to go to Netflix, I think that would yeah. be the natural progression. But in terms of the book, I think it's just a standalone. It's one book. Um, I haven't really talked about it becoming another book. Um, I think because it was so intense for six years, I'm quite relieved to have a break from Alexa. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think other writers that we've interviewed in this series have talked about how, um, you know, you may not write another book or may not think you're going to with these characters, but they kind of they kind of hang mm. around like ghosts. Yeah. And every yeah. now and again, you know, like Sam has a poltergeist. Right. You know, maybe you've got to. Maybe you've got a literary poltergeist. You're going to start yeah. moving the prose around in your future books. But sure, who knows? Um, you know, yeah. Um, Daniel, Daniel would be a yeah. great character. I should see more of too. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a kind of piece of work, isn't he, Sam? Yeah, he's the, he's the alternate voice. So we've got Alexa, and then we've got Daniel, and and actually that it gives the book gives you as a reader space to breathe. I think because he has quite an intense story in his own right as well, all yeah. the way through. But it, but it gives you that it's the light and shade which i think is very sure. clever that your narrative works really really well yeah, um, yeah. did you have did you have sorry i've gone after to ask another question here so <laughs> you probably got one too I, and i know we've hit one o'clock did you did you make a conscious decision at the start to bring him in and have a dual narrative or did you yeah i really wanted the readers to have an experience from both sides of the room because i think what i've certainly experienced as a therapist is the experience that I'm getting even though myself and a patient may be in the room we're having very different experiences it's a bit like you know when you have three siblings they they've all potentially had very different childhoods yeah so yeah. I, I really liked that the reader could come in and just kind of see both sides of the room um and uh because it, there is always two sides to any story yeah it's very clever it works really really well that's really excellent. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's good, Thank good you. to see uh, Ita, one of our regular 
viewers saying, well, I know what I'm reading this weekend. For oh, sure. how lovely. Thank you, Alex. I, mean, I think that's what's so nice about this. And thank you so much for being with us for an hour is that it's actually, there aren't many opportunities to spend an hour with a writer talking about their work. And I think what we find on this, what we find in this series is that people actually during this, they're already on Amazon buying the book. And I think oh, that's yeah. uh, it's wonderful. So it's I'm sure it's gone up a little bit as a result. Of <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. I've thoroughly I've enjoyed been, talking been with you. Really uh, and I'm looking for, we, we feel like we've made so many friends in this series that it's going to be so nice at some point in the near yeah. future when we're at a festival together and be um, like, yeah, oh, yeah. wonderful, won't it? You're, you're in 3D. You're, you're <laughs> exactly. Not just shoulders and head. Yeah. Amazing. I think we'll have to invite everybody in. Everybody we've spoken to will have to have Yeah, we should meeting. do. Have a little mini Yeah, festival. that would be great. Wouldn't that be fun? That'd be great. <laughs> oh, listen, thank well, you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been absolutely brilliant. So, guys, you know now to the book link is in the comments and um, you can order your own copy from uh, whichever supplier is nearest to you. If they don't have it in your local bookshop, um, just get them to order it in because it is available. And it is a gorgeous hard copy, which is a hardback mm -hmm. copy, which is also lovely too. Um, I guarantee you will be transfixed by the characters. So thank you very, very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. It's been cool to have you. And thank you so much for bringing us in here, Simon. Um, next next time we come around, um, Simon is going to be um, in the hot seat, but we we'll wait and see who. It's going to be a surprise. Yeah, I've been so a I look surprise. forward to joining you. It's, really, it's lovely. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Bye-bye. A bit longer. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.